In September 1998, the FBI raided the homes of five Cubans in Miami and arrested them, accusing them of conspiracy to commit espionage, among other charges. In actuality, they had infiltrated anti-Castro organizations in the U.S. in order to prevent and collect information on attacks against Cuba. It was only after they had shared information with U.S. authorities that these authorities decided to arrest them. In 2001, all five of them were sentenced to between 15 years and two life sentences. Two of the Cuban Five, as they came to be known in the Cuban Solidarity community, were freed after completing their sentences in 2011 and in early 2014 with the remaining three released in late 2014 after having served over 16 years in prison when the Obama administration agreed to reopen diplomatic relations with Cuba. Welcome to Interviews from Quito. My name is Gregory Wilpert and I have the tremendous honor today to introduce and to uh, talk to the Cuban Five. Thank you for joining us. You were found out, uh, most of you, uh, some of you had already been released, but most of you found out in December that uh, that you would be released from prison. I just want to know, how did you find out and what was your reaction when you, when you heard about it? Um, three of us, we were transferred to a medical facility in North Carolina, Bogner Medical Facility, and different time. But the 16th, the day before we were released, we had a meeting in the morning in that prison. And that day was the one that we know that that we are going back to Cuba next day, eight o'clock, we should be in Cuba. Until that 16, we don't, we don't know. We have some clue that it could happen, but, but what I can say is uh, all of us, from the beginning, we were sure that we would come back to our country, to our family. And uh, so everything was very fast in a little way surprise and of course um, it was a I could say one of the happiest day in our life if it's not the happiest one for our family and our country our people and all the friends around the world what were some of you others thinking when when you heard about the news in my case they uh, took me out of Vito Bureau penitentiary in, uh, in near Los Angeles on December 4th and they didn't uh, ask me to pack or di didn't uh, tell me where I was heading to, nothing. They just called me for, uh, to the lieutenant's office and uh, when I got there, they moved me to the R&D, reception and departure, and uh, basically put me in a plane there to Oklahoma. Then in Oklahoma, I was uh, placed in the hall again for 11 days. No information at all why I was there, uh, where I was heading to. You mean by the whole solitary confinement? Exactly. And uh, they uh, kept me there for 11 days with no news at all of what was going on. Friends on the outside found out that uh, I, I had been transferred. And they started calling the Bureau of Prison, but nobody knew anything. So at the time, uh, we kind of started uh, suspecting that something might be going on, something either good or bad. And uh, I had to spend those 11 days there counting the hours in the, in the cell, not knowing how long I would be there. Then in uh, 15, they moved me from there to the prison where my two brothers were being taken to. Next morning in the 16 is when when we finally met and are informed that we are going to be in Cuba the next day. The two of you were already uh, released. You had served your sentences. How did you find out about it? And did you know well advance uh, about the possible release? Or did you just find out very quickly like as they? Well, we, we didn't know in advance. Uh, it was something, something that was uh, uh, kept very close. Uh, and we were not aware of what was going on. But of course we knew that Gerardo had been transferred. Then uh, about eight, nine days later, uh, someone called me and, uh, and, and told me, you know, Tony and Ramon, uh, they have been transferred to, and they are both in Butner, North Carolina. 
So that was a little bit suspicious. And the next day, that same uh, person called me and tell, told me the three of them are, are the same place. That had never happened before. We were never together at the same place. Of course, my hopes were uh, uh, getting high, but I, I didn't want to uh, be uh, uh, excessively optimistic. Well, let's, um, let's review a little bit about what happened. Uh, when you were first arrested, it was in 1998, I believe, uh, until uh, 2000, the end of 2014. Uh, tell us a little bit briefly, and for an audience that doesn't know the story, as to what happened, just in kind of in a capsule form, if you can, uh, what, uh, uh, what exactly happened? The, the story goes back to the uh, relations, relations between the U.S. and Cuba and the aggressive policies against the, the Cuban people by the U.S. government. Uh, to make it short, uh, on the 60s, the CIA uh, had the second station in Miami pointing to Cuba. And as a result, a lot of terrorists and, and criminals were uh, paid for by the CIA to damage Cuba. And as time passed, those people developed the power over the, the whole Miami city. And they kept Miami as, as, as the, the point to keep doing things against Cuba, attacking Cuba, putting bombs, uh, uh, doing raids. So the Cuban government sent us to the US, to Miami, to infiltrate those groups so as to prevent this ter those terrorist activities. Uh, in the 90s, after the Soviet Union crashed, uh, the Cuban economy started to rely on tourism. And they, they decided that it was the time to crush Cuba by uh, scaring away the, 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 the potential tourists to the island. So they started to plot putting bombs in hotels, shooting a hotel from, from uh, speedboats. And uh, we were monitoring those activities. In 1997, Fidel Castro sent Gabriel Garcia Marquez, the uh, Nobel Prize winner, to Washington as a mutual friend between, uh, of Fidel and Clinton to convey to the U.S. government the necessity of the two countries to cooperate on terrorism. And Garcia Marquez went to Washington. He met the uh, Clinton staff, and they decided that the terrorist activities of those people were uh, dangerous enough so as to be, you know, uh, warranting uh, a cooperation between the two countries. In June 1998, the FBI sent a delegation to Cuba, and they were given a lot of information, a dossier, on the terrorist activities of, uh, of those people, their names, their offices, their training camps, everything. And the FBI promised to the Cuban government to come back to the U.S. and do something about it. And what they did was, three months after that, on September 18, uh, 1998, uh, they arrested us who were monitoring the terrorist activities. And that, uh, in short, that's the origin of the Q1-5 uh, case. Uh, in my opinion, it was a betrayal by the Clinton government of the trust that Fidel had deposited on the, on, on the good faith of, of the Washington uh, government to, to do something together against terrorism. And that's how it, how it, uh, that's how it started. And the rest is history. Of course, you all went through a very difficult ordeal from what I've heard. Maybe you could tell us uh, and our viewers a little bit about what the conditions were in which you were first imprisoned. I, I think uh, uh, you were, it was a complete surprise arrest in the middle of the night or something like that. Tell, take us a little bit through those steps, the arrest and then the uh, subsequent uh, imprisonment. Well, on the September the 12th, 1998, Early in the morning, about 5.30, 5.30 a.m. in the morning, between 5.30 and 6.00 a.m. in the morning. Uh, at the same time, the same day, they broke us in different houses, in our different houses. Uh, very, uh, you know, violent uh, scenario right there. And uh, they took us straight to the FBI headquarters in Miami. In that place, we have an interview with the FBI agents in charge of the whole operation, and they tried to convince us of uh, basically betraying Cuba, you know. 
they were saying, well, you know, Fidel Castro will abandon you, forget about Cuba. You can start a new life in the United States, a free, you can be free in the United States, having a new house, boats, money, whatever you want. Obviously, we are not the kind of people who betray our country or whatever. And uh, when they realized that uh, nobody's going to break at that time, they sent the five of us uh, straight to, uh, to Miami, to the, to the Federal, Federal Detention Center in Miami. But not to the population, straight to the hall. And we spent 17 months in the hall, just because. I, a hall is, is a terrible place. It's a, it's a cell, seven foot by nine foot, very dirty. Um, the, uh, the condition, very harsh conditions, you know. Um, the humidity is very high. The only thing is we have a shower inside, but everything else is, we didn't have a book to read, no pencils, nothing, no newspapers. Um, every day they shake down the room. Sometimes we try to save some, some food, you know, because the food was very scarce. And uh, we try to save some food and they shake down the room, the room every day. They rip the, the whole room out and everything, uh, you know, was pushing out of the, the room. Uh, well, very, very difficult for us. We spent six months uh, totally isolated, I mean, by ourselves. Then, when we went to the general population, the, uh, we were preparing for our trial. I can tell you that we have not the possibility of che checking out about 80% of our evidence. They did everything in their power to, to avoid that we can have a very, I mean, at least the right to defend ourselves. Then come the trial. The trial lasted about seven months. During that time, we, uh, we felt that we, we won the trial. I mean, f from the very beginning, the, uh, the charges were conspiracy, conspiracy to commit espionage, conspiracy to do whatever. And you know that conspiracy is a charge uh, which is used by the government when they don't have evidence enough to, they don't, they don't have to show evidence. They don't have to show that two people or three people have an agreement of doing something. With that, for them, it's enough to, to convict you of the same charge as you have committed the whole crime, you know? And that's the kind, that, that's the kind of uh, charges the government use when they want to punish you. And especially in our case, that we, are, we were political prisoners. And uh, where well, we went for the, the, during the whole trial, of course, in Miami, it's impossible for us to have a, a fair trial. In Miami, uh, first, we were investigating people in Miami who were in charge of the uh, many organizations in Miami, very violent organizations, Commandos F4, uh, the, uh, the Cuban American National Foundation, which is one of the most, more powerful organizations in Miami. They control everything in Miami. They, they control the police, they control the, uh, everything. They control the TVs, the radios, the station. So it's impossible for us to have a fair trial in Miami. And at the end, we uh, were convicted of the whole accounts, and we were sentenced, sentenced to the harshest sentence possible. Gerardo, my, our brother here, he received two life sentences, plus 15 years. That means he had to die twice, and when, we, when he reborn again, he had to do another 15 years. It's crazy. My brother Antonio, he, uh, he received one life, plus 10 years. René, he received the, uh, the longest sentence possible in our case. In his case, even the judge said that she, she, <laughs> she, find, she didn't find out um, a better way to, to give her more time because that's, that's the, uh, so he received about 15 years. That's the most uh, sentence, the, the hardest sentence he can receive. And uh, Fernando, uh, uh, 19 years now at the beginning. And in my case, I received one, one life plus 18 years. So that's, that was the scenario. And after that, we were sent to prison. Something we have to say is that uh, through all the 16 years, we didn't receive any special treatment by, by the US authorities. They didn't consider that we were a different kind of prisoners, not at all. And we had to spend, uh, to share the, even the cell with the 
criminals, uh, killers, uh, drug dealers, all the time. Some people said, oh, you were Cubans and kind of political prisoners. They might have you separated. No, not at all. We were exactly like, like uh, every other prisoner in maximum security in prison, in some, some cases, and uh, no consideration at all with us. All the contrary. When a regular prisoner doesn't have uh, uh, many difficulties difficulty to get a visitor approved, in our cases, as you know, uh, uh, Rene Gonzalez's wife and my wife for many, many, many years were denied visas to, to be able to see us in prison. And in the cases of other uh, of our relatives, the visas uh, sometimes they were uh, held for too long and different kind of uh, problems. So no consideration at all. Uh, um, one of the things that uh, Certainly the, the situation with the wives was very difficult to imagine also that there were a number of ups and downs during the trials. I heard that in one case you had appealed the sentence or the, 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 uh, the conviction and it was approved by the higher court and then another court reversed it. Can, that, can one that of you tell us in a, about that? In, in 2005, after they sentenced us in 2001, we appealed the sentence to the appeal court of Atlanta. And uh, they took a four year to review. They created a panel of three judges, three judges, and they, those three judges, they took a four year to review that appeal. And they come out with the decision, unanimous decision, 93 page. And the decision was, was the first issue of the appeal that we cannot, we cannot have a fair trial in Miami. They got to do a new trial. There is something that illustrates very well. I mean, there are many instances in which we can uh, explain the, the, the travesty of justice. But uh, since, we, since we are talking about the, the appeal process, and we're talking about this panel, this three judges panel that ruled that a new trial was needed because uh, the trial couldn't be held in Miami, that was an unanimous, an unanimous decision by a, a, a three judge pan, judges panel. The government appealed that unanimous decision, and the unanimous decision is reversed by the M Bank panel of uh, 11 judges in the Court of Appeals uh, in, in Atlanta. Two years later, we had to go through a new round of appeals, and we lost that appeal in a divided decision. Two judges against us and one judge in our favor. It was, there was no uh, agreement between the th three judges. There was uh, a divided decision. And then we asked for the same kind of review that the government had, a had asked when the uh, decision had been unanimous, and we were denied that, that uh, review. Well, it seems pretty clear that it was a very political case and very political decision. As a matter of fact, in the U.S., uh, many people also recognize that. And so that leads me to my last question, because we're pretty much out of time. But, um, what was the role of international solidarity? I mean, to some extent, you must have been aware of the solidarity that was expressed with your case and with your uh, situation. Uh, what role or what impact uh, did it have, do you think? Yes, international, international solidarity was very, very important. Not only for the five to be finally released, but also for the five to be able to resist every single day through 16 years. The support that we received from many, many, many friends in the United States and in many other countries, and of course in Cuba, uh, was very important. It was a source of uh, inspiration to us. And for that, we would like to uh, thank all the brothers and sisters that uh, for many years were on the street supporting us, uh, making other people be aware of our case, demanding our freedom. To all those people that contributed in your struggle for freedom, we want to say thank you today. Uh, let me tell you something, because we are talking to the U.S. people here. The U.S. people was denied, denied the knowledge of this case. This trial should have been on the front pages during the whole process. And the, the media corporations, they decided not to talk a single word about this case. And if the U.S. people had been informed during the trial, I'm sure, that they would have rejected what happened there. But 
once the solidarity started to develop and um, some uh, very important players in the U.S. learned about the case, they joined and they did a good job also, uh, on which, which also was a good part of, of, of the outcome of the case. And I'd say that even though the United States government never, never acknowledged the campaign, I mean, the publicly acknowledged the campaign around the world, and even within the United States, they were very well aware of what was going on. And I, 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 I think it was a crucial uh, element in, a, in, a, in the final decision by the U.S. president to, to release the three uh, brothers that were still in prison. Uh, it was not the only element. There were other political uh, elements in place. But uh, the fact that the U.S. government was uh, very well aware of the, uh, and was receiving the pressure from around the world and from within the United States was a very important fact in the, in the final out outcome. And now that we are in Ecuador, we had the, uh, the wonderful chance to express our gratitude to one of the persons that really fight very hard for our freedom, the President Correa, also the Parliament of Ecuador, and a lot of people here. So this day that we have spent here in Ecuador, uh, we had the chance to, to know the country. It's a great opportunity, but also to embrace and express, you know, very close that gratitude that we, we want to express to all the people through this program. Too. So thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for coming and for sharing your story with us. Uh, it's really been a very uh, amazing story and also very heartbreaking in many ways what has happened to you. And uh, I hope that uh, this will be a lesson also for the U.S. empire and for the U.S. Uh, uh, policies toward Cuba, which has now changed. I think that's uh, really an important step forward. Well, thanks so much again for joining thank us. You. Thank, thank, you. thank you. And thank you for joining us at Interviews from Quito. I hope you next, join us next time. Uh, my name is Gregory Wilpert, and I was joined this time by the Cuban Five. Thank you.